Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, let me bring you to order and welcome you to this event, which is the latest policy and practice seminar uh, run by the UCL Department of Political Science. I'm Meg Russell. Uh, I'm Professor of British and uh, comparative politics in the department and the director of the research center called the Constitution Unit and I'm here to chair this evening's discussion. Um, we're on the eve of International Women's Day today so we thought that we would uh, dedicate uh, this, this evening's session to women in politics. What's going on particularly in the UK uh, and we've, uh, we've labeled it progress, pitfalls and prospects. Obviously, we have um, an election on the horizon, and a big question is going to be what's going to happen to women's representation in Parliament after that election? What's going on with the selection of candidates? How might Parliament change? Um, we have made quite good progress in the UK uh, in years to date, but we're still at only 36% women in Parliament. So is that going to go up? Is it going to go down? What's the experience of being a woman politician like? Uh, is it becoming more positive, more negative? What can we learn from experiences so far? What puts people off going into politics? Um, and whatever our wonderful panel wants to talk about. So we've got a fantastic panel of four here this evening. Um, I'll introduce them in the order that they are going to speak in. Um, Dr. Sophia Collignon is a Senior Lecturer in Comparative Politics at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. She's also a former member of our department and contributor to the Constitution <laughs> Unit. So it's really wonderful to see um, Sophia back here with us this evening. Um, and I know the quality of her research has been fascinating. She's an expert in the study of candidates, elections and parties and gendered violence against political elites. Um, and her article, Increasing the Cost of Female Representation, The Gendered Effects of Harassment, Abuse and Intimidation Towards Parliamentary Candidates in the UK, was selected as the best paper published in the Journal of Elections, Public Opinion and Parties in 2021. That's sign of the quality of her work. That does all sound a bit depressing. Um, we're, we're not going to entirely do depressing this evening, but um, the story isn't a wholly positive one. Um, next we have uh, Antoinette Sandbach, um, who's a former barrister. I have here farm manager as well as politician. Um, Antoinette was elected to the Welsh Assembly in 2011, and then she went on to be elected to the House of Commons in 2015 as the Conservative MP for Edisbury in Cheshire. Um, she was, and I know this from my own research um, on the impact of Brexit on Parliament, unfortunately one of the 21 Conservative MPs who was stripped of the whip by Boris Johnson as Prime Minister for her voting uh, on Brexit. Um, for I think you would probably say against a no-deal Brexit, wouldn't you? Uh, uh, and Antoinette subsequently switched to the Liberal Democrats, uh, tried to fight to keep her seat in 2019, but was not successful in that. And I must say, since leaving Parliament, is looking extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> um, we then have Dr. Emily Harmer, uh, sitting next to me, Senior Lecturer in Media in the Department of uh, Communication and Media at Liverpool University. Um, she's published extensively uh, about legacy and online news media coverage of UK elections and the online othering and harassment of women in public life. Uh, so she has a book entitled Women, Media and Elections, Marginalisation and Representation in British Politics, among other things. So very well qualified to be on this panel. And finally, last but not least, we have Farah Hussein, who's a PhD candidate um, at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. Her research focus particularly is the experience of Muslim women in the Labour Party, and she has great interest in intersectionality issues. She's also herself been, I think you're not anymore, uh, a Labour councillor in the London Borough of Redbridge um, and has worked in both regional uh, government and in Parliament. So a fantastically well-qualified panel. Um, we're going to just have opening remarks of about five minutes each from the speakers. Then we may have a bit of discussion between ourselves before handing over to you uh, in the audience. Um, just a note on the 
what's going on with the recording. Uh, this is being recorded. Um, so there will be a video available afterwards on the department's website and YouTube channel and our podcast after the event. So bear in mind that if you do want to speak, if you want to ask a question, you will appear in the recording. If you don't want to appear in the recording, you might want to um, gently encourage the person next to you to ask the question or, or something. And uh, we will let people know when the recording is available so that if you've enjoyed the event, you can let your friends know about it and encourage them to watch or listen. That is more than enough from me. So let's pass over to Sophia to get us going. Thank you for this uh, very nice introduction and very generous introduction. I'm very happy to be back home today. And also, uh, I mean, as the general election approaches, this is a very timely opportunity to take a stock and see where progress has been made and where we have to do maybe more. So in five minutes, I would like to make uh, three points. The first one is that progress indeed has been made with regards to women representation. And the difference is at every stage of the, of the political ambition cycle. Also that it is in the interest of political parties to have more women and more diverse women standing for parliament. And my third point is that despite of, uh, of progress, women still face some specific barriers designed to make it more difficult for them to participate and fulfill their right to be uh, politically active. Um, so I will start by saying that, you know, through the pipeline of political career, there has been progress in the supply and demand of women in politics. Um, Firstly, a record number of women stood for election last time. So in 2019, we saw a total of 37% of women candidates standing for office. Um, this is an improvement of 8 percentage points compared to 2017 and an 11 percentage point compared to 2015. So this is actually uh, like a big improvement. And this, is, this happened despite of how difficult it is to organize a campaign from a snipe election. So the fact that we observe more women standing for these two elections, even if it was a snap election, meant that women were ready to run for office. This is also partly due to different efforts made to recruit more women. And I am pretty sure that a lot of people know about the all women, uh, all women shortlist that Labour started to use in 2002. And that led Labour to be the first party that proposed more women than men as candidates in 2019. So this is huge news and it uh, represented an increase of 11 percentage points over previous elections. However, this is not the same story in every, uh, for every party and the Conservative Party, for example, only improved in one percentage point the proportion of women that they were presenting for election with a total of 31 percent. And I mean, that directly translates to the number of women that we see in Parliament. So in 2019, we elected the Parliament with a record number of women as MPs. However, the majority of these women were standing um, in, were in opposition. More women are being elected, but also we see that and more women are standing, but also see more diverse women standing. And in 2019, we saw a 3.7% of uh, ethnic minority women standing for office, which is an increase compared to what we saw in 2010, for example, of 1.9%. This might not sound like a lot, and it's not. Uh, however, there is some progress being made there. Also, I want to say that it's not only about the number of women that stand for office, but also what we are seeing in terms of who gets elected. Um, I'm conducting some research with Kat Smets in Royal Holloway, and what we are finding now is that when women stand, they win. So when women stand for office, they are not penalized on the ballot box. Actually, voters want more women MPs. And also, in terms of uh, ethnic minority women, what we observe is that in 2010, when we started to have these records, we saw that minority ethnic minority women were penalized in the ballot box. However, the effect has been declining over time. And in 2019, this is actually a group that performed ever, uh, better than any other group. I mean, except for white men, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's a positive story anyway. Uh, and I will say that actually, uh, I mean, this is a positive story that we want to have more women, but also more diverse women in office. 
Um, so these findings should encourage political parties to actually increase the pool and the diversity of their, of their candidates because, you know, they are not going to be penalized. On the contrary, they are going to be electorally rewarded by doing so. And I want to finalize my, uh, my five minutes with very quickly talking about the challenges that women are facing right now and where I think that we should pay more attention um, in view of the next election. The first one it relates to the cost of running for office. In the UK, women have to apply to more constituencies before being selected than men. Women have to spend much more money on selection processes than men. Women are still more likely to face contested selection process and uh, also, women are more likely to put more money in the selection process. However, if they put more money, it doesn't necessarily translate to more electoral success. So sometimes the money that they put in the selection is not compensated during the election, um, during the election and that means that money, um, money becomes tight. And also, women are expected to do much more constituency work before they get selected compared to men. And that, combined with other kind of uh, non-paid labor that women do might become a burden. And finally, it's also uh, the issue of an increase of abuse, harassment, and intimidation. In 2019, we saw that one in every two women actually and unfortunately suffered of any form of abuse, harassment, and intimidation, which included being uh, online threatened, but also being followed, threatened, or being loitered around, or followed on the street. Um, we see that men as well are being subject of abuse, harassment and intimidation and this, unfortunately, the proportion of men and women is increasing. However, it is increasing to a faster degree for women. So we need to do something and we need to do something quickly. Why is this important for representation? So we see that women that are being harassed and men that are being harassed, abused or intimidated, they don't necessarily, uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect on a standing down, from off, uh, uh, standing down from politics or not necessarily. However, what we are seeing is that women are modifying their campaign strategies and also the type of issues that they speak about. Because we know that visibility attracts abuse, then a lot of women are, being, are refraining from discussing particular topics or engaging particular activities. So it's not only about the descriptive representation of women, but also the substantive representation of women and allowing them to speak freely about the issues that they consider important. Thanks. That's uh, wonderful, Sophia. Thank you for getting us going. And your research on harassment um, in previous elections has been so important. Um, and it's obviously a significant worry if it's going up, and we may focus a little bit more on that. Antoinette. Would you like to start us off? I, I will. So having been through um, the process, I can um, endorse that there is change and we are seeing more women. I think it's important to say that the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament have much better figures for women. And my experience as an elected member of the Welsh Assembly was that I had virtually no abuse or threats at all, which was a very different experience to the one that I had in Parliament. Um, I was elected as a single mum, so um, Sophia talked about the barriers. Uh, my child was eight when I was elected, and it meant that I had to put her in boarding school because the salary wasn't high enough to cover childcare costs, and I didn't have extended family in the area that I represented to to look after her and that's a very real price that women pay and I think it's one that's not really talked about. Um, it's illegal to employ someone to look after your child day and night so you'd effectively have to be like Nicola Horlick and have a night nanny and a day nanny and it was just absolutely impossible. And so that is a barrier for um, single parents and most single parents are women. So that is, is a hidden barrier, I, I think, and one that's not openly and properly identified. Um, Sophia was also right to say that women have to modify the way that they campaign now. Um, as a rule, I would never go out knocking on doors on my own. Um, and I would get very anxious if I go out in a pair, but I'd recommend going out in a four. Um, but I would get very anxious if I lost sight of my colleague because I'd gone ahead or he'd gone ahead and that let, meant that I was on my own. And I think that stemmed from the fact that I did, in fact, 
get an enormous amount of abuse having been named a traitor, a mutineer, a saboteur, and God knows what else. <laughs> there are quite a few names that I was called. Um, I was threatened with rape and beheading, and my family were also threatened. And I think um, I, I spoke in many rooms like this. I spoke to all my sick forms in my constituency. I really encouraged particularly women to stand, but I'd encourage all of you to stand for election because actually being a member of parliament and being able to make change is such a privilege and it's a really extraordinary job. And it's a job where there's no qualification that you have to hit before you apply to do it. So anyone can do it. It does that. I think the strongest characteristic that you need is tenacity and persistence. Um, but you do need to have a, a very thick skin. You're going to spend four days a week away from your family um, coming to London or they need to move, which if you have a partner means that their job might be affected. So there are other barriers um, to women being elected and that's why actually I think it's really good news that we have made the progress that we have because it, it dramatically changed in 1997, I, I think. Um, the positives are that, that women make their voices really heard. Uh, maternity is one of m the most underfunded parts of the NHS and some of the debates. Um, I personally was very involved with um, baby loss and we developed, worked cross-party and we developed a national bereavement care pathway which is now adopted by 145 NHS trusts in the UK and is the gold standard. That was done in, in four years, so even though I was only in Parliament for four years, I felt that I used my time wisely. And there is a kind of sisterhood in Parliament. You'll find that behind the scenes, women will work very well cross-party with uh, MPs from other parties to try and affect the change that they want to see. And it's so important that our voices, that we have a parliament that represents the community that we live in. And that means a really diverse parliament. It means I, I supported a 50-50 parliament. Um, but I think, I, I think people need to be aware that there are some you know, big personal costs to standing. And I am concerned about the level of miso misogyny, sexism, that the toxic debate in Parliament, I have to say, I have been really depressed about the standard of debate from some of the Conservative MPs like Suella Braverman, who I think have stoked div division as an MP, um, I would have said that our role is to bring communities together and not to try and other people and divide them. And I think that seeing those kind of attacks is actually not doing any favours to Parliament, to the reputation of MPs and how our work is seen. And I think, um, I think MPs as a whole hold a responsibility for showing that um, we can ha that we can disagree agreeably to to um, to use the rest is politics quote. <laughs> um, so I I would say to anyone who's thinking of standing, go for it, um, do it. You can start at a local level. You can get involved with things like police and crime commissioner ele elections. We don't have enough women police and crime commissioners. Local councillor, local council, going standing for your local council, which Farah would tell you. But it is so important that people engage with, with politics and make their voices heard. And for me, the, the level of the debate, to my mind, worries me that people are switching off it or only switching on to it in an extreme way. Thank you so much, Antoinette. We're now going to turn to Emily to give her reflections. Oh, I'm, I'm going to switch around. I was going to start with some discussion about online harassment, actually, but I will start with um, mainstream media because it's. I'm going to try and draw together two sort of strands of my work. So, as Meg kindly mentioned, um, I published a book a couple of years ago that looked at 
um, a basically studied 100 years of women's representation in UK press coverage of UK elections. Um, so I'm going to try and draw some positives from this, um, but as you'll see, they're quite kind of caveated in a way. So basically, if you look at, um, so in the book, I look at voters, women candidates um, and women leaders, as well as family members of politicians. But I'm just going to talk about politicians because that's kind of what we're focusing on today. Um, essentially, you, and I kind of try and take um, heart from this. I think press coverage, press discourse around how women were talked about changes over time and it can you know, progress and then it can regress. Um, and I'm gonna try and draw a positive at the end about kind of how I think it's slightly on a positive trajectory at the moment. So basically early press coverage we see um, is actually very positive about women, you know, the kind of recognition from the press that actually we've got this whole load of women voters who need to um, have it politics explained from people that kind of can talk their language as it were. So it's, it's much more positive, if slightly patronising at times. It's much later, I would say, you know, around the 1960s, 1970s, where we actually start to get much more um, problematic press coverage that is overtly sexist, you know, from the press's point of view. So they report about sexism earlier on, um, but it's when we get a rise in much more opinion coverage in the news that you start to see much more overt kinds of sexism. Um, and the point I wanted to make that was slightly more positive is that I actually think looking at, and I've done a little bit of work on Thatcher and May, but looking also particularly um, at Liz Truss's recent experiences, I do think despite um, there still being some problematic attitudes reflected in um, mainstream press discourse. I do think women in power in leadership roles is much more normalised. I think you see less of the kind of subtle forms of sexism that we used to see um, in kind of how politics is discussed in the media. Um, and I mean, particularly around, you know, if you have a very, very challenging time like Liz Truss, I think the, the um, relative absence of really over mainstream coverage of her is quite surprising in a way although you know press partisanship is obviously an issue here which we could probably talk about later so I do think we're in a time it might go it might go backwards as I said it tends to go in cycles with these things um, but I do think at the moment we're seeing a normalization of women in leadership roles I have to say though I'm not sure that that's trickling down to ordinary candidates in quite the same way if you're less well known then you still get some of that sexist discussion about your family and you know what you know your childcare arrangements or all those kinds of things that you know you're less likely to hear about male candidates. So um, to sort of bridge on to talking about very briefly online harassment, um, I think the main, sometimes we do get these kinds of eruptions in the press which can actually feed online harassment. So we see sometimes um, if you get particularly um, a bit of a savaging um, of a particular MP over a particular issue, this can cause um, online um, re response and online um, harassment in some way. Um, I've done a bit of work with my colleague Ros Southern at the University of Liverpool where we've looked at kind of what online har harassment looks like and we've kind of find that it's actually quite a spectrum of behaviours so we kind of call it othering and harassment in the sense that there's quite a lot of subtly sexist stuff going on there um, as well as the more overt problematic things that um, have been, we'll, we'll probably get to talk about um, in a moment. Um, so it's much more, so we know actually looking at kind of research in this area, which has been out for the last few years, men and women candidates and politicians tend to receive similar amounts of um, online harassment. However, the types of harassment they receive is very different. So as you can imagine, women candidates are getting much more identity-based attacks or kind of threats or even this more kind of subtle sexist stuff that basically is there to remind you that you don't really belong and that you shouldn't be there. Um, and then just to end, I'm going to talk about local councillors very briefly, hopefully to seg into our next speaker. Um, I've done, Ros and I were doing some um, interviews with local councillors about their experiences of this um, uh, over the last year. And we found that, you know, actually for local candidates, this sort of stuff is even more 
problematic. They have fewer support networks and also they have, um, sometimes they have to be in rooms with people that have harassed them online, which obviously creates even more of a hostile environment um, for kind of a diverse set of candidates. Um, so, you know, I think just to add, if we're adding things that we think we need to look at more, it's, you know, we need much more kind of support and research in this area for local level um, politicians, I think. That's hopefully that was not too much more than five minutes. That was perfect. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, we'll pass to Farah. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so my, my research, I was a local councillor for four years in East, for eight years actually, God, uh, eight years in East London and um, my research, my PhD research mainly focuses on the experience of Muslim women in the Labour Party at the local level and whenever I tell people that I'm uh, researching sexism and racism in politics, they always say, oh, so you're interviewing MPs and things, and in MPs and people, and I'm like, no, actually I'm interviewing local councillors and they sort of eyes glaze over and they sort of move on. Um, but actually, um, local government is often overlooked, but extremely important. And it's important because local politicians often become national politicians, but also because local government in itself is very important. So I was 23 when I was voting on budgets of a billion pounds. And I was 25 when I was promoted to the cabinet and in charge of council housing and homelessness in my council. No one scrutinised me apart from the other councillors in the room. And, you know, good for me, but probably not good for decision making and policy making at the local level, which is incredibly important and where most people actually um, access the state and access any support. Um, and that's why I'm looking at it. Um, so how do women fare at the local level? Well, women are, surprise, surprise, underrepresented in local government, um, but they're even more underrepresented at local government leadership level which is incredibly important in councils that have a strong leader model. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details because it is very boring, but there are types of councils where the leader is very important. The leader gets to make lots of, de gets to make lots of decisions and only 17% of those leaders are women. Um, and that means that these billion pound decisions are quite often led by men, which is, you know, they might be making good decisions, but they also might not be. And they might not have the breadth of experience that everybody in their communities um, would like to see reflected in the decision-making process. Um, so my research has focused on uh, interviewing Muslim women about their experiences in the Labour Party. And I'll take you through my sort of the headline main findings. So, these women face racism. So I have uh, interviewed women who have told me about experiences where they've been at council meetings and uh, they've, you know, that councils do these sort of like big meetings once a year and you can bring along your family and everybody gets flowers. It's, they go on for like five hours. It's very boring. Would not recommend it. I took my husband once and he was like, never again. Um, but um, my friend, uh, my, my friend, the woman I interviewed, she took her mum and uh, a opposition councillor said to her mum, I'm really, really surprised that you're here because I didn't know Muslim women were allowed to leave the house. And isn't it great that your daughter knows how to speak English? And she was like, yeah, that is really great. Um, so, and you know, that was one of many experiences that these women had. I had an, uh, interviewed another Muslim woman who told me that she was taken off a specific committee because they, it was deemed that there were too many Asians on the committee. So uh, she was replaced by a white woman. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, I could go on. And then these women also face sexism. And the sexism they face is quite often from within their own communities, which makes it really difficult to talk about. And there is a kind of, um, there's a sense through these women's experiences that uh, a sense of decency and honor Honor plays a role in how are they how they're viewed by their own community. So sometimes women are prevented from standing for the Labour Party because they're seen as being um, too westernised or too dishonourable, um, or uh, they're prevented for standing for election because they're seen as being. Uh, too honourable, like politics is a dirty game, women shouldn't be involved, what are you doing, you're too good to be involved in politics. So whichever way, 
women miss out and um and they miss out because not because they're women not because they're muslim not because they're south asian but because they're all three of those things all together and that is what my research is showing is that because these women tick all those three boxes they face particular forms of discrimination which other people don't face and it's not saying other people don't face discrimination they do but they face different kinds of discrimination and one particular barrier that these women face is when they talk about this kind of discrimination because it's a really uncomfortable thing to talk about like sexism within ethnic minority communities is really like people feel really little like, oh, um, about it um, people just try and push it under the carpet so I've had women who have had their faces photoshopped onto pornographic images and then sent around on WhatsApp to the local community and then when they complain about it their colleagues say to them it's just politics and then these women say, it's not just politics because it wouldn't happen to you. It's happening to me because I am who I am. And um, within the Labour Party, if you're interested, you might have read about there are lots of complaints about the complaints process not working properly. Um, so these women feel like the processes, processes within the party don't work for them. Um, and quite often this affects how women feel about the party and um, they're less enthusiastic than Antoinette about encouraging other women to go through. So I interviewed one woman who said, you know, I really, I used to encourage women to stand for the party and now I just, I think, am I leading her up the garden path? Like, what am I actually encouraging this woman to get into? Because is she going to be the next person to have her photo, her face photoshopped on a pornographic image? Um, I could talk lots about the role of party members, the particular... Uh, importance of selection, party meetings, uh, in the process of becoming a counsellor and women's experiences. Um, but I will stop now, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get to the audience shortly, but let's just um, have a little bit more discussion between us while you please formulate your questions and be ready to stick your hands in the air. Um, I might just ask you a question along the along the line here but do chip in on uh, each other's if you if you feel the urge um Sophia I'm not sure you told us I think you're probably the likeliest person on this platform to know where we stand in preparation for the election which is going to happen within the next sort of 10 months and could be as little as two months away where have the parties got to in terms of selection how much do we know is, is the number of women going to go up or down and, and and how is that distributed between the parties uh, well, it's very scary to think that we might be two months away from an election. <laughs> I'm not really sure if I want it to be now or, I mean, I'm not, I don't feel ready. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of, sele of selection, so I was talking to people from the Labour Party and they have already completed the majority of, the, of their selection processes. And interestingly, one of the things that I am very curious about is whether, so before we had the all women shortlist, and this is going to be the first time that, uh, that we don't have it, right? So I was very concerned to see whether we will observe a decrease in the number of women standing for office by, uh, for the Labour Party. However, what I, uh, what they are mentioning now is that actually they put a lot of attention in the committees uh, to try to increase the number of female selectors and uh, and also to try to encourage them to put pay attention to this, to selecting more women and that they are not concerned about decreasing it so on the contrary apparently they are very optimistic about it now the democracy club is also compiling a list of all the select, uh, the selected candidates and they are finding as well that we are not going to expect a decrease in the number of women being selected and that actually there is an expectation that we are going to be observing the most diverse pool of candidates in the next general election. So that we, it is expected to see an increase in the number of women, but also of ethnic minority men and women. Mm. And I think that particular part is important because, I mean, the UK has become one of the most, or an impressively uh, diverse country. And it's not only London, but also diversity is everywhere, and it has been in the public agenda, especially since the pandemic. I think that it was a rise with uh, all Black Lives Matter, etc., and all the movements. So it has been on the political agenda much more, and I think that we are going to see a response on the number of people and diverse people that want to stand for office and want to make the difference. I was 
So there is, um, I'm sorry, just very briefly to conclude, there is the risk as well that we are going to be, I mean, that with all the conversation about abuse, harassment and intimidation and how toxic politics have become, that a lot of, uh, of women are standing down for office. However, it's true that what we might be saying is that new women replacing women standing down. So speaking about the sisterhood, it might be also an effect of, okay, you took it, you took the hit, let's say, for five years. Now I am taking, uh, you know, taking over. In a way, it's a way of losing expertise. So I'm also not saying that it's a positive thing completely, but it might be as well a way in which women are responding to protect other women. Yeah, that's very that interesting. And it's very, it's, it's very encouraging that the Labour Party is doing okay in its selections because all women shortlists don't apply. For those who know a little bit about this, it's interesting that the reason they're not using all women shortlists this time is because they got a majority last time, which means they're not allowed to anymore. So the fear is they're going to slip back because they can't use that mechanism. But you want to come in, Antoinette, and I was going to ask you, I mean, the answer to the question what's going to happen to Parliament after the next election is if the polls are right, then we're necessarily going to see an increase in the number of women because Labour is better at selecting women. And if the number of Labour MPs goes up, the number of the proportion of women will go up. What is it with your party? Uh, and, X party. And your, yes, sorry. You, you, of course, you can represent yeah. two parties on this platform, so, uh, while so. Farah's representing a third. <laughs> but it seemed like in, in, the, in the Brexit time, which was clearly such a big part of your experience and so painful, a lot of the people who stood up um, and tried to sort Brexit out in your former party, it's very striking, were women. There were some very brave women like Anna Soubry and Sarah Wollaston and Heidi Allen and Justine Greening uh, and even, um, uh, I'm going to forget her name, Caroline... No. no. It's gone. It's gone. Spellman. Caroline um, Spellman, yeah, yeah, who was trying to negotiate compromise. Um, I wonder whether that tells us something about gender and politics and basically what's the future for women in this party because a lot of you are now gone. So, so obviously I'm a Liberal Democrat now yeah. and I would say that um, at the moment there are twice as many Liberal Democrat female MPs as there are male. <laughs> so there are 10 uh, w uh, female women Lib Dem MPs and five men. Um, so that's quite a good track record but with the Conservative Party it's not good. Um, the, there is an organisation within the Conservative Party called Women to Win, which specifically encourages women to stand. But the real issue about selection is making sure that women stand in so-called safe seats. Um, there has been a good history of, uh, of very white seats. I mean, my constituency, I know you, you talked about um, the melting pot that's, that's in the UK, but my constituency was 97.3% white. And, um, for example, Kemi Badenoch in Saffron Walden, um, Nusrat Ghani, there have been some really good selections by the Conservatives in good, strong seats. But I fear this election coming forward, we're going to go backwards. And, and, th and that's for two reasons. 35% um, of the MPs standing down are women. And from the Conservative Party, this is. And um, quite a few of them are young women that have only done a five-year term. And I do think that that is actually a reflection around... Um, perhaps the reality of the job, you know, if you've been elected for Anglesey and you're travelling up and down <laughs> um, and not seeing your family and you're getting loads of abuse, I, I think there are some women that have just thought, I'm not going to put up with it. And to be honest, I think there was an element of that in... 78 Conservative MPs stood down in 2019. Um and there was an enormous amount of expertise from the Conservative Party that was lost. So people like Amber Rudd and, and others. And um, obviously, Anna Subri, Heidi left um, to, to go to Change UK. Um, and at the moment, with the selections for the Conservative Party, only 25% there are only 25% of candidates selected as women and all the rest are men. So the other 75% is, is men. And I think that that's worrying for who's going to be there. Um, 
Mind you, I'm not sure how many Conservative MPs are going to be there at all. Um, so, so that in itself is going to be very interesting because the party, to my mind, is incredibly split. And the main battle is not going to be a male-female battle, but a, but a centrist, right-wing uh, battle. And um, I'm quite looking... I mean, it'll be very interesting to see what happens after the election and who is left. But I think um, in terms of the moderate candidates that are coming forward, that's possibly a reflection of the selection process whilst Rishi is Prime Minister. If the Conservative Party gets a new leader on the right, I think that may change. And um, I'm very glad I'm not in it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, I mean, I, it's sad for me because it's a party that I fought elections for for many, many years. But to my mind, it's lost its, it's, lost its values. It doesn't accord with the values that, that I have. And it's very difficult to change party. It's not an easy thing to do. But I think, it's, um, I, for me, politics is about values and trying to improve people's lives. And I, th I think... There's going to be a real battle for the soul of the Conservative Party after the next election. And I, to my mind, I hope it goes the right way for the country. And for women, of course. Yes, and for women. <laughs> Emily, I was really interested when you were talking about the media coverage of, of uh, women leaders. And you mentioned Theresa May, who, of course, was at the helm for a lot of the time that Antoinette was going through this painful period. And she got a really hard time as a leader, you know, she was much criticised. To what extent do you think, would she have been treated differently if she was a man? Did you detect sexism in that treatment or was it just sort of fair negative treatment that anybody would have got, do you think? I mean, I think that's a really good question, but also I'm probably going to disappoint you by saying it's a, um, a bit of a difficult question mm. <laughs> in the sense that, I mean... What, it's difficult to separate motivation of you know the the criticisms and the treatment of her from the effects. So I think regardless of whether you know it was in it was motivated by the fact that she was a woman um, in a p very difficult situation. Um, sometimes the the particular ways in which she was talked about do hit different just because she is a woman. So for example, the kind of Maybot stuff, the fact that she's kind of seen as robotic you know, activates all those kinds of stereotypes about women are supposed to be caring and kind of empathetic. And the fact that she kind of struggled to convey that about herself, um, at least um, during, you know, the election um, coverage that I kind of looked at. I think that, you know, as I said, regardless of motivation, I think it does, it, it does kind of um, play into people's perceptions about what a leader looks like and what a leader should be like. And I think, um, you know, I suppose actually in terms of the kind of similar, you, you, there have been similar criticisms of kind of Rishi Sunak, of course, in terms of him perhaps not being able to kind of be as empathetic as um, other leaders but, um, that proceed. Um, but again, I think, obviously, I mean, there's all sorts of issues going on there, which I won't go into because we're talking about women. Um, but, yeah, I, I think I think there was, but again, I do think it's quite subtle now. I think it's quite, it's a lot more difficult to detect um, than it would have been, at least in mainstream coverage. I think this is, um, I was talking to Sophia before we kind of came uh, up here. Um, I, we were kind of reflecting on actually some of the kind of worst kind of sexist stuff now comes from so-called new media. So, you know, some of these more alternative um, news sites, which are much more kind of openly partisan and happy. Well, I mean, not more partisan than some of our press, obviously, but um, they are happy to kind of make remarks that uh, um, are kind of more overtly sexist. Um, and then obviously that plays into the whole media ecosystem. It gets shared online. Um, and it kind of adds to the, therefore, the perception that this person isn't perhaps doing the job that they could. Um, which is why I said I was quite surprised that the coverage of Liz Trust, to my mind, wasn't as... It could have been absolutely awful in terms of, you know, the kind of questions around, uh, you know, her competence and so on, could have been very much activating all these kinds of stereotypes. And I felt that, I mean, I haven't quite got the data for this yet, but I feel like it's not... 
as bad as it might have been, you know, had this happened 20 years ago. So that's why I was slightly optimistic, although, as I said, you know, these things tend to go in cycles, so who knows when, the, when it will change back again. That's, that's really interesting and nice to be somewhat positive. And maybe, Farah, I could just end with you and then we must go to the audience. As to, we're hearing that the Conservative Party isn't in a particularly happy place here. Do you think the Labour Party sort of got, got it sorted out now? Uh, I mean, doing very well on women's representation, but you have intersectional concerns and obviously you're particularly interested in minority women. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago when the Labour Party was debating sort of improving representation on different fronts. It used to be said, well, we've got all women shortlists, why can't we have all black shortlists? And um, some of us used to say, well, you know, women can be black too. Because uh, <laughs> it was sort of a contest between white women and black men, it seemed. Has the Labour Party got this sorted or does it still need to take action, do you think, to address under-representation problems that haven't been addressed? Um, so actually quite a lot of ethnic minority women were elected to parliament through all women shortlists. So it will be interesting to see the sort of intersectional impact of not being able to use all women shortlists during this election. I think the Labour Party has some quite deep-rooted cultural problems in the way that it supports uh, all its members, but particularly minority women. And I'm not saying that the Labour Party is worse than other parties, not by any stretch, but that's just the that's what I researched, that's what I know. Um, I think no party really um, properly appreciates the sort of particular forms of discrimination that minority women face. And I think, you know, the Labour Party's not not an exception to that. And the, th the thing with the Labour Party that people don't really, um, or people tend to overlook, is that the party members have so much power in the Labour Party. And part of my thinking during this PhD, you know, and as a Labour Party member, um, is why on earth has the party given me so much power like why do i get to decide who represents me on the council uh in my you know safe uh labor ward and why do i get to decide who represents me in parliament i'm not qualified in it any way well maybe i'm more qualified than other people but you know most of us are not qualified to do that you know my husband who's also a member is definitely not qualified to do that so <laughs> so why 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 does you know why does the party give up so much of its power to members and i haven't really got to the bottom of that um i have actually read something that meg wrote about uh, party membership that helped a little bit but um i think yeah i think there's something there and party members are they are atypical like 1% of the population is a member of a party. Um, so we are not normal people. And um, why do these un abnormal people have so much power? And um, how do parties work to counteract certain biases that might be present within party memberships? I don't think they do very much in terms of the Labour Party. Um, so I think there might, you know, the headline figures might be fine after this general election, and there are women's organisations within the Labour Party that are keeping a close eye on what happens. But that doesn't mean that the culture's changed, and you can speak to women in the party who say, "Yeah, fair enough, this woman might be elected, but was she only elected because she was selected by a local party where her dad knew, you know, two hundred of the members or whatever?" You know, like it's there's there's wider cultural problems beyond the headline figures. My, my experience is that parties are desperate for people to stand as local candidates and that if you want to stand, you'll, your hand will be bitten off. I, uh, for you lo know, local council candidates. Local council yeah. candidates. Yeah. But yeah. that's actually quite a good route into, yeah. into Parliament if that's where you want to go. And, it's and, quite and a as thing to do in its own Exactly. Way. As yeah. Farah said, um, it carries a lot of responsibility. It decides that, that uh, how your local services are delivered. And, and so in it, you know, it's, it's not just a stepping stone, it's a worthwhile thing to do. And we do not have enough young people. You know, most of the people that stand for, to, to, for local councillors, where I am, are kind of all retired. Mm, yeah. and, and it's really important that people engage and put themselves forward and get involved. Okay, we must go to the audience now. Um, 
Alan here is going to go around with a roving mic. Could I beg a microphone off this side of the room? Because maybe two of you can share, three of you can share two microphones. Um, and invite um, maybe three questions at a time. Could you put your hand up if you want to ask a question? And um, if you, maybe you could say your name. And also if there's anybody on the panel specifically that you're pointing your question at. So there's a woman there. I think the microphone might not be on. Sorry, that's probably my fault. <laughs> <laughs> is that any better? <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the one one is about sexism and the way that Theresa May was represented. I think actually there was a lot of sexism in the rhetoric of of the press, Lexit being one of them, and also during the Tory leadership race. I think if I'm correct, it was Andrea Ledson commenting on the fact that she was better qualified as a mother. Um, so she would be able to run the party better and the country, therefore. So I think that's one thing I potentially would like to hear your own reflections on. And the other element is the intersectionality point. Um, and as a female person of colour um, and a South Asian person of colour, it's quite disheartening to see the likes of Swella Braverman and Preeti Patel be my sources of representation in British politics. So I think my question for the whole panel, and maybe Antoinette and Farah as well, is seeing those representations of women and p people of colour um, in positions of power almost gatekeep access or be quite derogatory and inflammatory, how does that affect women wanting to get into politics? How does that affect the reputability of women in politics? And also, how do we navigate re repairing those sorts of damages. Well, Thank you. Interesting. And there's a woman over here in the stripes, and then there's a man a bit further back. This is on. Um, just a really quick question on, have you sort of, when you're doing research, have you found gender data gaps as well, specifically sort of when you've done the research and looking into all of that? What was your name? Uh, sorry, my name's Ananya. Okay, great. And there's a young man here. Uh, my name's Malachi, um, and I have two main questions that I'd like to ask. Um, firstly, um, Angela Rayner was accused of crossing and uncrossing her legs to distract Johnson uh, whilst in Parliament. Um, and to prevent coverage such as this, should media moguls and organisations be more heavily scrutinised in order to prevent tropes like this from being spread? The other question that I'd like to ask in, is in regards to the three female MPs which were provided police protection. Um, should constituent MP interactions uh, have more heavy regulations placed upon them to prevent harm of female MPs? Very good questions, but I must say you're a sneaky lot because two out of three of you asked two questions. So um, if we're going to get another round of questions in, we're going to need pretty quick answers. It would be a shame not to fit in another round. Should we go the other way along the panel? Pat Farrah, would you like to start? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just pick out the bits that I, I think I can answer. Um, on Suela Braverman and Priest Patel, I mean, ethnic minority people can be conservative too, and they can have quite, uh, you know, quite right-wing views that other people might disagree with, that's fine. Um, I think the problem that we have, I mean, in my opinion, I think the problem that we have is that um, the Conservatives, like Antoinette actually mentioned, the Conservatives are very good at selecting ethnic minority uh, candidates in non-ethnic minority dominant seats, where they're very likely to win. And the Labour Party is more focused on uh, on sort of matching the demographics of the seat with the with the candidate, um, which means that sometimes the candidates don't win. Um, so I think where we should be mostly directing our sort of um, upsetness of, about these being the about these two women being the most uh, prominent ethnic minority women is at the parties for not doing or at the Labour Party for not doing a better job at. at lifting up its uh, its women who want to represent the party at the national level. Um, uh, in terms of gender data gaps, 
I mean, other, uh, you know, Sophia and other people might be better well-placed to answer that than me, but um, it, the, the problem that we have is that nobody collects this data. Like, the parties don't collect it. Like, there's no central database that where, as if you're a political candidate, you fill in a form and it goes and gets scanned into a computer and everybody can access it. Like, we don't have that... Um, there's not that depository for this kind of information. Like, a lot of academics' time is spent searching through databases. A lot of people who work um, on intersectionality and ethnic minority representation have to guess the ethnicity of somebody based on their photo and their name, which doesn't really work. Um, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, the, the data is poor. And there is, there is actually, there is a something in the Equality Act, a clause which hasn't been enforced, where parties are, have to collect that data, but it hasn't been enacted. But if that was, that would make such a difference and make our jobs much easier, probably. Um, and Shall I pass along, because I'm just aware yes. of the time. Yeah, and maybe I, what I yeah. should have done was uh, be more directional and yes, say, right, sorry. you take that sorry, one, sorry, you take sorry. that one. I'm going to tell you, I hope this is pleasing to you, to take the Angela Rayner question, which sounded yes. a brilliant question mm -hmm. on media regulation. Yes, no, that's an excellent question. And, and I think, you know, to, to reference to that particular case, um, I think this is one of those stories that crops up because, you know, something gets said and then somebody online, um, usually these very interested political blogs, who I won't name for whatever reason, but um, that then leeches into the mainstream discourse. And obviously this is kind of people having a field day over this particular incident. I think I will just talk, I will talk about regulation in a moment, but I will just say with Angela Rayner, I think there's a particularly, you know, classed element to the way in which she's treated by both the, the, the people sitting opposite her in the house, but also kind of in the press. You know, this is a, a woman who kind of had a child at very young. She didn't go to university. She, you know, barely has any, had any qualifications, worked her way up um, through being a kind of shop steward through unions and so on. So I think very much um, there's an intersectional issue with her as a, a particular case. But in terms of regulation, I mean, I would be all for... Um, <laughs> Better regulation. I mean, the, uh, everyone. In, in case people aren't aware, you know, the the print press in the UK is self-regulated. So there's a couple of different regulators. Most of the national press that were doing this kind that do these kinds of stories are kind of self-regulated through Ipso, which is basically they mark their own homework. It's all other editors kind of commenting on stuff, and if they get things wrong, they print retractions five months later, and it's like a postage stamp size rather than the the front page splash that they had, which I do think you know in turn might actually put people off. So yes, I I would do, but obviously getting post in a post Leveson inquiry environment where. Um, much of the press very much strongly rejected the idea that they would should be regulated. Getting them on board with any of that is particularly difficult. And also regulating around gender, I think, is particularly um, difficult because there is there is an element of subjectivity to some of this kind of stuff. Um, uh, not in that case, I would say, um, but in some of the things, I think it is kind of these are sort of things that regulators don't go anywhere near. Even if we look at our regulated media, i.e., broadcasting, they don't go near gender issues because, um, well, for various reasons I could go on all night about, but um, yeah, it, it's extremely difficult. But yes, I personally think this should be, you know, the bare minimum. I mean, hopefully, you know, we could educate journalists not to do this kind of stuff, but yeah, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Antoinette, um, pick, pick, pick something, maybe the thing about constituency protection. Yeah. I mean, it's very striking. Stella Creasy made this comment just in the last couple of weeks about campaigners outside MPs' homes being very intimidating, particularly to women, and this driving out debate. Well, I think, um, I think academics and journalists um, carry a real responsibility not to reveal the home addresses of MPs. Um, there was a lot of media coverage about me recently saying that I was um, trying to take my name out of slavery research. I wasn't. I was trying to get my home address removed because at the time it was put out in the public domain, I was giving evidence against a police officer who threatened to kill me and harass me. And um, that address has now been revealed not only to convicted abusers, and I had at least six people cautioned for threats against me, but also to the abusers that were never caught. But 
one of the great things about being a constituency MP is going out and meeting your constituents. And I had a lovely constituent, constituency and I loved going out and about. But because of the threats uh, um, against me, I wore a, um alarm, which um, if I press uh, under all my clothes, which if I pressed it um, would basically get, would get allowed an armed police response team to listen into what was going on and decide whether or not they needed to dispatch uh, dispatch them to me. And um, you are hearing MPs, it's not just women actually, it's also, um, well, it's it's coloured women, it's it's coloured MPs, so I, ha uh, so, um, I had to report threats um, to N Nadeem Sahawi, which were left on my constituency office telephone, and also to Diane Abbott, who, who receives 50% of all the threats against MPs because uh, because she gets racist abuse as well as misogynistic abuse and lots of threats of sexual violence. I think it's really important that we call the behaviour out, that we just say it is not acceptable. I think um, the Information Commissioner has to be much stronger in how he regulates the release of information. I think, uh, I think it's absolutely unacceptable that MPs' children... And, and wife who who may not have had very much choice or husband like mine didn't have any choice in whether or not I was going to stand I was going to stand uh, but he was affected by the abuse as was my daughter who and and the way that um, she had to deal with it and people need to realize that MPs are human beings and and we have to abs we have to call out this othering however it happens it just should not happen it's really important in a democratic society that we can speak about things that we believe in and try and speak for our constituents without being intimidated, harassed, threatened with violence. Uh, and it's just, I, I think it's completely unacceptable. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it's... Ca it, it, it's increasing from what I can see. Um, it started very much with Brexit and it's, it's, in, it's becoming more common, not less. And I think society has, as a whole has a role to play in how that's done. And the social media organisations should not allow anonymous accounts in the UK. Um, we are not a country where you need to have an anonymous social media account because of fear of repression. I understand why you may do in other countries like China or Russia, but we but we shouldn't have it here. Oh, I really want to get some more questions. Sorry, in. I just want to say very quickly, um, from the research, actually, most of the kind of online harassment that happens is people with using their own name. <laughs> Anonymity is a bit of a red herring, I think, in terms of kind of dealing with this stuff, because it's impunity, I think, the fact that they, don't, they get away with it is, is more of an issue than actually any form of anonymity. Sorry. Interesting. Okay. Sophia, do you have burning things to add, or shall I bring some more people in and come to you first? I just, I'm aware there's eight minutes left, which is probably my bad chairing at earlier stages, but I do want to get in some more questions. Um, if we've got some more hands. We've got one over here. Uh, there's a woman towards the back there. Depending how many questions they ask, that might have to be it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick to one. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Connor. I'm a student here at UCL. Um, my question sort of more to do with um, procedural things. So, um, for example, Parliament, I think, Antoinette, you talked about sort of, um, you know, being away from your family for about four days a week. Um, I'm sort of conscious that Parliament is sort of, I mean, the way it, it works is it sort of evolved over time. Um, and that started with predominantly male representatives. And so there's, you know, female representatives haven't had as long to sort of put their mark on how things work and are there sort of procedures in parliament that that we could change or should change to make them sort of better or encourage female um, candidates to stand to be MPs and um, but then also from the the council perspective as well and um, I don't know much about councils but I didn't realize there were different sort of ways that councils make decisions um, should we sort of reflect on sort of um, procedures in, at the council level as well interesting thank you uh, there's a 
blonde woman right towards the back. And we might have to stop it there because um, I haven't left enough time. <laughs> OK, hi, I'm Lauren. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, it was announced, I think, last week that there's going to be a package of funding for protecting MPs due to uh, recent threats of violence, especially surrounding the Israel-Gaza conflict. Do you think more needs to be done, not only to protect MPs, because obviously everything that happened with Jo Cox, who for everyone who doesn't know was murdered um, by one of her constituents, do you think more needs to be done to protect local councillors as well, and that the media needs to try and like almost not push language towards MPs that could be seen as inciting violence as obviously at the end of the day it's someone's personal safety on the line yeah thank you very much this I think it would be very good to start with Sophia and you can pick up where we were before on these questions about harassment and protection and what can we do we've got a new parliament coming how can we make it better well, one of the things that I wanted to highlight before is the fact that there are a lot of new different resources right now and a lot of organizations looking at, um, you know, at creating or at highlighting the importance of changing the discourse, but also providing more support. Like Hannah, for example, has been part of the Joe Cox uh, Foundation initiative um, to do more resources. Also, there is fantastic work being done right now by the local government association, producing resources, materials, and support to candidates, and also supporting officers um, like to deal with abuse, harassment, and intimidation. Because on a way, this is an issue that took us all by surprise. Uh, mainly because we consider, and I think that the UK is a very safe, um, very safe country, and also uh, tragic incidents are very fortunately very rare. Uh, now, on the, I mean, it's awful, but let's take, put things a little bit on perspective on, on that front. Um, I think that having more resources for MPs, so I'm going to be quick on that, but uh, having more resources to MPs is great. There is an issue that relates to the procedural um, question, the question about the procedure. So MPs are not employees. And the same happened with, uh, with uh, consulars. So they are not employed. They are like self-employed kind of to perform, a, like to perform a job, right? So there is a lot of constraints about what public money can be used for. Um, so the fact that there is now a budget to help them, it means that the procedure has changed to recognize that they are per, like, doing a civil duty, uh, a civil, um, a public good, and that therefore we should all be behind and help them to be safe on that. Uh, in the case of consulars, unfortunately, it varies so much depending on the consul that they are working for. And if the consul decide to have, to recognize that actually paying for security is, is not providing them with an individual and personalized good, but it's a public good, then they are supported. But th that means as well that the experience of consulars and people standing in office, it's, it varies hugely across constituents, uh, constituencies, but also consuls. So we, so. Antoinette, do you want to talk about procedure? Yes. Um, uh, by the There we go, start again. Both um, Parliament and the Senate have said that they are family friendly, which is fine if you live close to the Parliament or Senate, but where you're four and a half hours away and you cannot commute those kind of distances, it's not family friendly. Um, and But I think to a certain extent, you've just got to accept that it is a six day a week job and that if you want to do it and you're going to represent a constituency that is four hours from Parliament, that that is the price that you pay. Um, I, I just don't really... S I, I mean, there, there's a crash in Parliament. They're doing a lot more to try and, and, and make sure that you... You know, sometimes voting would go on till half past 11 at night, but it wouldn't be 2, 3 on in the morning, which it used to be. So I think women have actually made their, their voices heard in, in Parliament. I think there's a lot more that could be done at the local council level, both in terms of councillor safety. I think we need to get rid of the ridiculous thing where you publish an address, your address. Um, 
on on your nomination papers i think that should automatically be excluded um but it's voluntary, yes it is voluntary but most people do it because they want to demonstrate that they're local <laughs> um or they live in the ward and, and that's part part of the problem i think thank you emily um you said that um the anonymity wasn't the answer to online harassment. So that now might be your opportunity to say whether you do have any answers to make things better. Um, <laughs> well, oh God, I mean, I, that's such a difficult question. I think, I mean, there's, um, I guess the answer is no, I don't have the answer. I think, I think, to, I think to, to some degree it's about you know, what kind of a relationship is fostered online between who are the people doing this stuff and, and who, are, who, are, who are they targeting? You know, I mean, some of the women that we spoke to have been harassed by fellow councillors, for example, online. And, you know, how there are things councils could do to kind of try and stamp that kind of thing out for a start. Um, obviously, when it's kind of ordinary people or you don't know who the person is because they could be anyone, you know, obviously MPs have thousands of followers so you know probably only a tiny proportion of them are kind of local to them um so yeah i mean i think there are things that could be done to foster a, a better um discourse online but i do think to some degree you know people are going to do what they do and i think there there needs to be um oh I, uh, yeah <laughs> This is the the question that I will be, be spending, you know, a lot of time kind of trying to work out. I, I do think um, that social media platforms obviously have a huge responsibility. We know, you know, in the recent years, they were very open and had very kind of clear ideas about safety over the last couple of years. That's kind of gone out the window with um, Elon Musk purchasing Twitter, now X. He doesn't care about online safety, sacked all the online safety team. It's now a complete, you know what's the word you know free for all um and he's kind of completely changed it so you know people engage with it in a completely different way so the fact that we're very reliant on these kind of platform um giants who are un, you know p privately owned most of them tra transnational companies that ha you know it's very difficult for um local legislators to do anything about is basically most of the problem and that will be the problem with a lot of the online safety bill kind of stuff that's happening in my opinion sorry i'll stop now thank you very much no it was a very difficult question <laughs> thank you um and farah uh Just, finally to you yeah sorry i'll be really weird legal position. Councillors uh, don't get paid a pension, which is fine uh, if you're in your 20s, but then when you get to your 30s, you're like, oh, goodness, really need a pension. Um, and then um, also we're not eligible for uh, maternity or paternity leave. Um, so it's up to the individual council to, to implement that. So you could be a councillor and uh, be sacked from your position when you get pregnant, um, which you know would be illegal in any other job, but is uh, totally fine in local government. Um, and uh, in terms of protection for politicians, I think it's a really interesting thing, and I think it depends how it's done. Because when I was a local councillor, I would have surgeries um, where my, my ward members could come. And sometimes people came specifically to me because they knew that I would be a woman and alone and not in a weird, creepy way, but in a because they were a woman who'd faced sexual abuse and wanted to only speak to a woman. And I don't think they would have been comfortable doing that with a police officer in the room or so it would be have to be really sensitive in the way that it's done. Um, and sometimes people would come who did, wouldn't even live in my ward and I'd say, why did you come to me? And they said, because I read your profile on the website and I wanted to come and tell you about my problem and so I think it's really important that we keep that avenue open for people to access their political representatives. Wow some real dilemmas there thank you thank you so much you've been a brilliant um, panel um, let me just make some final announcements um, before we say goodbye um, we've got another policy and praxis seminar next Thursday evening which is going to be asking what can we expect from the European Parliament elections so you can sign up for that on our website 
Of course, I hope you're all already following us on Twitter and Instagram under our handle UCLSPP. That's where you can find out about our future events. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the audience who are here. I'm really sorry we couldn't get all the questions in. Uh, poor chairing, sack the chair. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's also just been so much to say and your contributions have all been fascinating. So um, thank you so much to our panel and I hope our audience will want to join me doing that in the traditional way. <laughs>